Hi, I'm Ethan. I love muzzle loading, and this is an early colonial American fowling piece. Long smoothbore hunting guns were popular in the northern colonies during the late colonial era and into the American Revolutionary War. Some doubled as service weapons for many militiamen. This fowling piece, or fowler, is signed Sergia Stratton on top of the barrel. Stratton, born March 7, 1705, living until July 30, 1758, of Hartford County, Connecticut, was an early colonial American settler who was a farrier, blacksmith, and gunsmith. He enlisted on May 1, 1758, as a clerk of the Connecticut Militia Company organized by Captain Nathaniel Holcomb under Commander-in-Chief Phineas Lyman of the Provincial British Army. Stratton died on July 30, 1758, at age 53, just shy of three months after his enlistment, likely in combat or from wounds received in combat. The time of his death indicates Stratton was very likely involved in the Battle of Ticonderoga between July 6th and 8th, 1758, considered to be the bloodiest battle of the American theater of the war, with the British Army suffering over 2,000 losses after a failed attempt to overrun the French-occupied fort and approximately 400 losses by the French. The signed barrel dates to around the mid-18th century and is fitted in a cherry stock with a later mid-19th century replacement W. Parker marked engraved pistol-sized lock that has been reconverted from percussion with a replacement cock and frizzen. It features an iron ramrod and replacement brass fittings, including the ramrod ferrules, trigger guard, small side plate, and butt plate. This fowler is absent its end cap and includes research documents on Stratton. When reading about this piece, you get to read about the history of the man that owned it, the man that carried it. And even though that much of this fowler here is replacement. We have a lot of the hardware being replacements. Very common for the period. And it's very common for American long rifles. It's rare that we see one that is totally original. Those are the exceptions. There are tons and tons of fowlers, muskets, and rifles in colonial America that were stripped, were places, things were lost, went through fires, you know, so while this might not be a totally original, you know, totally preserved colonial American muzzleloader, I still wanted to talk about it. I still wanted to go through it because this is you know, an example of the common man's muzzleloader for the day. You know, you have an early mid 1700s muzzleloader here. This is what many of us, you and me, could have had in colonial America. Might not have had, you know, curly maple, you know, American long rifles, beautiful, pristine condition. This is the kind of thing that many of us would have carried and would have had. This is what we would have gone out to hunt with, to sustain our families with. And it's what people like us signed up for and took when they needed to defend their homeland. And because of that, I just, I wanted to talk about this. I wanted to feature this Fowler because of that. Because this is the kind of thing that we would have had. You can tell already by its placement in the frame here, this is a very long fowler. Its barrel length alone is 56 and 3 8 inches. The barrel measures at a 60 caliber. It is a smooth bore barrel, but it still measures out to that 60 caliber, lining up with much of what we know about early American smooth bores being rather large caliber. So with this smooth bore barrel, we could hunt with shot for birds, or we could hunt with a passed round ball, or maybe a couple round balls, if we we're hunting some kind of game or using this muzzleloader for self-defense. It's very long though. This isn't the kind of thing you wanna get into close quarters combat with. That being said, let's go over the features of this rifle, starting at the butt stock. As mentioned earlier, this is a beautiful cherry stock. It has seen some age here. We see very a lot of darkening in this cherry, indicating you know it could have seen some sunlight or it has been colored through some kind of chemical process. I love seeing this grain structure here. And this isn't you know the beautiful, you know extremely fancy curly maple with the tiger striping we see in here. But it's still natural grain structure, and I think that's something beautiful. We can see. Dozens and dozens of beautiful curly maple long rifles, but sometimes it's nice to see just some normal wood on a muzzleloader. 
And that's what we have here. We have a simple crest here coming off of the stock. Again, kind of straight grain going through the wrist, making this pretty strong stock. We have a simple early brass butt plate here. Like many early butt plates in this style, we don't have an external facing fastener. We don't have a screw or a bolt here along the top. What we do have though, much like you'd see in other aspects of the hardware for a muzzleloader in this era, is we have a pin. We have a pin going through here, much like we'd see in a ramrod ferrule or a ramrod pipe. So there's a little tag on the inside of this butt plate here that lines up with this beautiful little pin. Really simple way to attach this and really affordable way. That being said, it's a very effective means of attaching this butt plate. So it's not to be you know, shrugged off by any means. On the back of the butt plate here, we have two large, beautiful early flathead screws. The first is back here at the top of our butt plate and the other is down here at the middle of the butt plate. I love, love, love these big early screws and bolts that are used to hold these early muzzleloaders together. They're just great. <laughs> you know, it's nice to go to the hardware store and find, you know, a little, little bolt head, you know, it's kind of, you can kind of hide easily, but there's something about these big early bolt heads that I just love. I can't speak personally to the authenticity of this style of trigger guard on this era of arm, but it does fit into the mortises that were left by its original trigger guard. We have a very single, very plain trigger here at the front, no adjustment in this trigger. What you, what you see is what you get and that's what you have. Odds are Stratton was hunting with this quite often. So whatever the trigger pull is like on this arm, he was used to it and he knew when that trigger was gonna break and that shot was gonna come off. Coming forward, we have our lock. Again, this is a replacement lock, but through the documentation, we can see this is a fairly accurate lock for this arm. I would love to see this in its original state, but I do appreciate that the parts, the original parts for this Fowler weren't cast aside, they weren't scrapped, or they weren't reused in history like we see so often. I think it's nice to see something preserved, something added to, and, and something kept, and at least it's noted that these are additions, these are replacement parts. Um, I think that's special, I, I really do. And to know and to keep this name, um, I think that's important. It, it adds something to it, you know, adds some connection to the owner and to the maker. If there wasn't a name on here, it could very easily just be, you know, called just a, a parts cobbled together muzzleloader and just kind of left at that. But because we have a name attached to it here, we have a history we have some documentation of this person. I think it adds a lot of special something. You know, it, it makes this piece special. Our tang coming off of our breech here is our very common traditional rectangular tang. It's a little smaller at the breech than it is at the tail. And we have another single large bolt going through here, connecting into our trigger plate, holding and compressing this whole area together to withstand the explosion and the ignition of the shot. We have a nice cut in this tang acting as our rear sight lining up for our front bead sight here. There are a few bands filed into the base or the breech of the barrel here before at the top we get to the maker's name and some very simple engraving here. This is the kind of engraving you can tell maybe that Stratton wasn't necessarily artistically trained. He wasn't necessarily artistically educated, but he could still add some beautiful patterns to the top of his barrel that he called his own. So we have some simple waves going through here, very common for the period, with some small notches at the base of each wave. Coming forward into the rear of his name, we have some vine and floral patterns carved here. Now this isn't like exquisite floral carving, these are simple lines denoting that floral or leaf pattern coming off of a central stem. Coming forward, we have our replacement entry pipe and our replacement ramrod pipes here. The barrel and the ramrod pipes are held together with pins. We don't see any barrel keys on this piece, much like with the top of our butt plate here. The whole fore end of the stock hardware is held on with these pins. And I will say here at the front, this pin is pretty much worn out um, through time here and, uh, and has let go. We can see here a differentiation in color of this cherry stock. And I want to show you this because this is what we're talking about when cherry ages. Ch cherry naturally ages and oxidizes, especially when left in sunlight. So if you have a cherry stocked muzzleloader and you want to age it naturally with the sun, you want to make sure that you're rotating it 
in that sunlight because you can get a point where the side facing the sun is going to be darker than the side not facing the sun. And we can see that in application here with this original Fowler. So the area of wood that is here underneath where that nose cap would have been, we compare that to the stock out here towards the front and we can see that color difference. We can see that age difference. Now that could be uh, just natural exposure to the sun and the air like I've talked about, or that could be you know, a chemical application. Our front sight is a shallow blade front sight, much like we see on many Fowlers of this era and of later eras. Our ramrod is metal, very similar in style to those that we see with military smooth bores at the time. We have a very large shaped swell at the tip of this ramrod. And then differing from several military arms from the period, we don't have any threading at the other end of our ramrod to accommodate any tools. Just to give you an indication of how long this fowler is, the buttstock is on the floor, the same level of floor that my feet are, and you can see that this fowler is a bit taller than I am. Our side plate side of this fowler is very similar to the lock side, very plain. We can just see the ends of our pins holding hardware to wood here. We have our single lock bolt coming through back here. Again, a very large lock bolt head. We had this added side plate extension here. Not very fancy, very simple, very subdued, and brass matching the rest of the brass hardware. I've really just kind of spent a few moments here um, just thinking about this piece and, and thinking about Stratton. And um, it's neat. Uh, we can read a lot of stories and there are a lot of, a lot of history about you know, major figures through history and, and the leaders and the wars and the battles. But we don't see often you know, just your normal person. And Stratton was one of those normal people. And uh, I, I think it's really neat. And uh, it's kind of moving, really. Uh, it's, you know, we, <laughs> life is really fast. Um, and it's, we're always kind of looking forward. But sometimes it's really nice to, to slow down and look back and hold something like this, talk about something like this, and read about somebody like Stratton. Um, it's informative, and, it's, and I encourage you to do so. I encourage you to, to, uh, to start looking up this name and start going through some of the documentation about it. Um, not that there's anything special about it, but just as an example of somebody that was. And uh, this is a piece of that person that we have you know, 200 years later, um, which is really kind of incredible. Um, really almost 300 years later. Uh, that's neat. That's neat. That's, this is, you know, in a way, apart from the documentation, what is left of Stratton. Um, and I think that's cool. I think it's neat that we're able to, to know that and to share that and to, to keep his story alive through his fowler, through his muzzleloader. And uh, that's the kind of thing to me that makes muzzleloading really cool. So uh, I hope that you've enjoyed this look at this, uh, you know, albeit used kind of beat up Fowler here. Um, there's something really special about it. Um, and I encourage you, if you are like me and, and see something special in this piece, check out the, uh, check out the Rock Island social media pages. We're going to post some more photos and videos of muzzleloaders with history just like this one. Um, and if it's the kind of thing that you're interested in, I encourage you to watch that stuff and, and learn about it. Um, you know, sometimes it's nice to, to slow down and, and let go of the hustle and bustle of today and, and read about the past and learn about it understand it a little bit more um, so that we can so that we can make sure these stories aren't lost. So um, I'm Ethan. I love muzzleloading. That's all I have for you today. Uh, I really hope you enjoyed this as much as I enjoyed showing you. I'd like to thank Rock Island for letting me show you um, this piece. Um, that's all I've got. So we'll catch you next time.